What is our universe fundamentally made of? Is it made from atoms, quarks, and other subatomic parts? Or is our universe best understood as a sort of cosmic whole, a totality that's greater than the sum of its parts? Are we nothing more than a temporary pattern of mass and energy bound by the laws of physics and chemistry? Or are we more like ideas swirling in the mind of God, transcending the confines of the physical universe? All throughout history, there's been an endless philosophical debate between two groups of thinkers. On one side, we have the holists, those who believe that the universe should be primarily understood as a dynamic system of wholes. On the other side, we have the atomists, who believe that the best way to understand the universe is by studying its most fundamental building blocks. So who's more right, the atomists or the holists? What is more real, the whole or the parts that the whole is made from? As it turns out, everyone is right, which is also a nice way of saying everyone is wrong. Let's get into it. There's an old joke about a king who asks a wise person, what is it that's keeping the earth from falling down? The wise person replies, well, sire, the earth is resting on a lion. On what then is the lion resting? Asks the king. The lion is resting on an elephant. And what is the elephant resting on? The wise person smiles and says, the elephant is resting on a turtle, my lord. The king breathes a long sigh and asks, okay, what is the... The wise person interrupts him. You can stop right there, your majesty. It's turtles all the way down. This is a holon, and it's one of the most important and useful philosophical ideas in modern history. Okay, technically this isn't a holon, it's just a free stock video that I found on the internet that I'm using to represent a holon. It's hard to show you an actual holon because holons are everywhere. Everything in this universe is either made of or made by holons. Because really, holons are the fundamental building blocks of the universe itself. So what exactly is a holon? Simple, a holon is anything that is simultaneously a whole as well as a part of a greater whole. For example, a whole atom comes together with other atoms and they become parts of a whole molecule. And then whole molecules come together and become parts of a whole cell. Those whole cells come together and become parts of a whole organ, which are then parts of a whole organism. All of these are holons. Atoms are holons, molecules are holons, individual cells are holons. I am a holon, and so are you. At every level of scale, we see that reality is not made of things or processes. It's not made of parts or holes. It's made of holons. It's turtles all the way up and turtles all the way down. At every moment, whole parts are creating new whole parts, which then create new whole parts, and on it goes. And every time a new whole emerges somewhere in the universe, it brings with it new qualities, new characteristics, and new behaviors that cannot themselves be explained by its constituent parts. Molecules have qualities that their atoms do not possess. Cells have qualities that their molecules do not possess. My dog Luna has qualities that her cells do not possess. In other words, each new whole is greater than the sum of its parts. New qualities emerge at each level, and therefore each new kind of whole requires a totally different kind of science in order for us to understand reality at that level of scale, giving us an entire spectrum of science from physics to chemistry to biology to the ever-branching schools of psychology, sociology, linguistics, and the rest of the liberal arts. Each of these schools of science was designed to look at a particular level of holons and have very little to say about the other levels. This is why we don't use physics to study human morality and why we don't try to understand the themes of Shakespeare by looking at the chemical composition of the paper that Macbeth is written on. It's holons all the way up and all the way down. There's no fundamental part in this universe, no bottom floor that everything can be reduced to in any meaningful way. Nor is there a single universal whole or omega point at the end of the rainbow. 
there's only whole parts or holons spiraling indefinitely in both directions. In order to better understand the story of holons, which is the story of the evolutionary universe itself, first we need to introduce this fella right here, an insightful Hungarian author and journalist named Arthur Kessler. Born in 1905, Kessler's work often grappled with themes of science, philosophy, human psychology, social justice, anti-totalitarianism, paranormal phenomena, and mysticism. As diverse as his interests were, through his writing he sought to find ways to pull these otherwise disconnected fields into a more integrated vision of the individual's place in society and society's place in nature. In 1967, Kessler published a book titled The Ghost in the Machine, named for the classic dualism of mind and body, one of the central problems that Kessler hoped to resolve in the book. We'll get into that problem a little bit later in this video. But another problem, as Kessler saw it, was that mankind's capacity for greatness was often undermined by its penchant for self-destruction, which I imagine was reinforced by the many technological marvels and terrors that he witnessed as a Hungarian Jew living in Europe during the early to mid 20th century. As Kessler saw it, human beings were prone to two primary drives. We either choose individual self-expression asserting our wholeness, our agency, and our separateness from the rest of society and our surrounding environment. Or we allow ourselves to disappear into something that we see as being greater than ourselves, letting go of our sense of wholeness in order to feel like we are part of something bigger, something more meaningful than we can find as isolated individuals. In other words, Kessler observed that human beings are simultaneously capable of acting as self-contained wholes as well as parts of even greater wholes. And it is within this critical polarity that Kessler believed that all of the hope and all of the misery of the human experience can be found. As Kessler saw it, the desire to become part of something greater than ourselves can often lead us to participate with social systems that are in fact far less than ourselves, because we often choose systems that were created by lower drives from more primitive parts of the brain, drives that seek to oppress and dominate other people. In Kessler's view, if we do not have an accurate understanding of how whole parts emerge, and if we do not know how to navigate the great chain of whole parts that have already emerged in nature and in human society, then our own contradictory struggle to simultaneously be a whole and to be a part of a greater whole can lead us down some very dark paths. Another story that Kessler tells in his book is a parable by Herbert Simon, known as the Parable of Two Watchmakers, which describes how the universe uses holons as a way to maximize evolutionary efficiency. It goes something like this. There were once two watchmakers named Bios and Makos who made very fine watches. The phones in their workshops rang frequently, new customers were constantly calling them. However, Bios prospered while Makos became poorer and poorer. In the end, Makos lost his shop and worked as a mechanic for Bios. What was the reason behind this? The watches consisted of about a thousand parts each. The watches that Mekos made were designed such that when he had to put down a partly assembled watch, for instance to answer the phone, it immediately fell into pieces and had to be completely reassembled from the basic elements. On the other hand, Bios designed his watches so that he could put together sub-assemblies of about 10 components each. 10 of these sub-assemblies could then be put together to make a larger sub-assembly. Finally, 10 of the larger sub-assemblies constituted the whole watch. When Bios had to put his watches down to attend some interruption, they did not break up into their elemental parts, but only into their sub-assemblies. Now, the watchmakers were each disturbed at the same rate of once per hundred assembly operations. However, due to their different assembly methods, it took Mekos 4,000 times longer than Bios to complete a single watch. And so it was that in his groundbreaking book, The Ghost in the Machine, 
Arthur Kessler coined a new word in order to describe the basic subassemblies that human beings and reality itself are composed from. Holons. In Kessler's mind, the idea that either parts or wholes have any real independent existence seemed a bit silly. There's no such thing as an up without a down, a mountain without a valley, an inside without an outside. And there's no such thing as a part without a whole. They are inseparable from each other. There's no absolute parts in this universe, nor are there any absolute wholes hovering somewhere above this reality. There's only an infinite chain of whole parts stretching in both directions. Turtles all the way up, turtles all the way down. So let's talk a bit more about what these turtles actually are, what they do, and why all of this matters in the first place. Let's invent a universe. Carl Sagan once said, if you wish to make an apple pie from scratch, you must first invent the universe. So how do we invent the universe? Well, as it turns out, you make a universe the same way you make a pie, layer by layer, with each new layer transcending and including the last. Which of course is exactly how this universe evolved in the first place. After the Big Bang, it took just a few millionths of a second for the first flaky layer of our cosmic pie to emerge, the first subatomic parts. It then took another 380,000 years for space to expand enough for those particles to cool and condense into the very first atoms, giving rise to all the stars and galaxies in the sky. Now we have the second layer of our pie. It then took another 168 million years or so before those atoms congealed into the very first molecules, which would form the third layer of our pie, things like minerals and polymers and planetary bodies. It then took another 9 billion years or so for complex molecules to come together and form the very first living cells, which gave us the warm, squishy filling for our pie, the very first traces of biological life which would eventually explode into an incredible diversity of living things. And on this process continued, whole parts coming together to form new whole parts, and creating entirely new realities as it went. From the most primitive prokaryotic cells to ever more complex and specialized eukaryotic cells that gave rise to the plant and animal kingdom, to some of the most basic multicellular critters like worms and sponges, to things like fish and frogs, to the increasingly complex nervous systems of mammals and primates, until finally us human beings pop out of the evolutionary stew. In other words, Evolution is itself the story of holons producing new holons, which produce even newer holons, which then produce even newer holons, each transcending and including the previous as new forms continue to emerge. It's a cosmic pie made entirely of turtles, all the way up and all the way down. I may be mixing my metaphors here. So now you might be saying, wait a minute, isn't that a hierarchy? I was told hierarchies are bad. Well, hang on a minute. There's actually a few different kinds of hierarchy that we can talk about here. One is called growth hierarchies because they're composed entirely of holons that evolve naturally over time. Another is called dominator hierarchies, which are the nasty, brutal, ugly kinds of hierarchies that we probably want to avoid. Let's talk about growth hierarchies first, which can describe an entire sequence of holons like atoms to molecules to cells, as we've been talking about today. Or they can describe the developmental stages of increasing wholeness that a particular holon can grow through over the course of its lifetime. Like the rings of a tree, every stage in the journey gets encoded into the holon's very being, each transcending and including the previous stage, allowing it to become stronger, more resilient, and more whole with every new cycle. Which is why these hierarchies are also sometimes referred to as actualization hierarchies, because with every new stage, the holon becomes more of itself. But some holarchies do not necessarily grow over time. We might talk, for example, about letters, words, and sentences. Each of these units transcend and include the other units, 
Each is simultaneously a whole and a part of the next whole. This is an example of a holearchy, but it's not necessarily a growth hierarchy. In fact, they're not even really holons, at least not in a true sense. We'll talk about why that is in just a little bit. But another example of a holearchy is something like towns, states, and nations. These historically did emerge over time and have a holarchical relationship with each other. We might think of these as something like a social growth hierarchy. We'll get to social holons a little bit later in the video. But the important thing to remember here is these growth hierarchies or holarchies are very different from the sorts of dominator hierarchies that we always need to be exceptionally careful about. The main difference here is growth hierarchies transcend and include their lower stages, while dominator hierarchies typically suppress or oppress their lower stages. For example, when a group of atoms come together to form a molecule, the molecule does not try to oppress its constituent atoms. It embraces and enfolds its atoms. It doesn't seek to abuse or marginalize its constituent parts. Instead, it wants to nurture and nourish those parts, the same way that you want to nourish your own vital organs, because your health depends on their health. What's more, growth hierarchies actually want to be transcended. They want to be subsumed, to become part of the next emerging whole, whatever that may be. Dominator hierarchies, on the other hand, do exactly what their name suggests. They dominate. They maintain power at the top by oppressing the lower stages of the hierarchy and exerting forceful control over those lower stages. Often in violent ways, as we've seen all throughout history and as Arthur Kessler witnessed during the mid-20th century. And these hierarchies usually do not want to be transcended or subsumed or enfolded into a higher whole. It's a hierarchy of superiority. The higher stages are seen as superior to the lower stages, which is usually enough to justify their violent methods of control. Growth hierarchies emerge organically from the bottom up, with each stage transcending, including, and in a very real sense, loving its previous stages. Dominator hierarchies, on the other hand, are usually imposed from the top down and often sustain themselves by subjugating the lower rungs of its self-imposed ladder. So when we're talking about these holonic hierarchies or holarchies, we're talking about something very different than the sorts of dominator hierarchies that we've become so familiar with in our political, economic, and religious institutions. This is an important point, because while we certainly want to do our best to dismantle oppressive or dangerous dominator hierarchies wherever we find them, we also need to be careful not to eliminate healthy growth hierarchies as well, or else we strip all of the depth out of the universe, and we're left only with a flat and hollow shell of a cosmos. So, what do holons actually do? Well, a lot, as it turns out. As I mentioned earlier, with every new holonic level comes a new set of qualities and behaviors. But there's also a number of universal qualities that all holons everywhere possess, no matter where we find them. In his book, Sex, Ecology, Spirituality, Ken Wilber describes the major qualities that govern holons at every level of reality, which he calls the 20 tenets. We won't go too deeply into these, but let's run through them real quick. First, reality as a whole is not composed of things or processes, but of holons. Pretty self-explanatory, we just talked about that. Next, holons have four fundamental drives. Self-preservation, self-adaptation, self-transcendence, and self-embrace. This is another way of saying that all holons have an inward drive towards their own agency or their own self-preservation, as well as an outward drive towards communion with other holons on their same level, called self-adaptation. They also have an upward drive towards the next holon, which we call eros or self-transcendence, and a downward drive towards all previous holons within them, which we call agape or self-embrace. These four drives and directions are inherent to all holons, wherever we find them. 
and it helps us better understand Kessler's concern that the upward drive towards wholeness can often be confused with the outward drive towards communion with groups that can actually take us further away from that wholeness. Next, holons emerge. In other words, all of this didn't just show up out of nowhere. The cosmic pie evolves, layer by layer. Next, holons emerge holarchically. This is what we just talked about a minute ago, that evolution proceeds by creating a sequence of whole parts. Next, each emergent holon transcends but includes its predecessor, which again is how holarchies emerge in the first place. Next, this is an interesting one, I think. The lower sets the possibilities of the higher, and the higher sets the probabilities of the lower. Here's the easiest way to think about this. A long time ago on this planet, evolution went with carbon-based life over something like silicon-based life, which limited the possibilities for what could emerge later on. If it had chosen silicon, perhaps there would be an entirely different set of possibilities, allowing different kinds of organisms to evolve that we can barely conceive of right now. But as it is, those possibilities are limited. From this point on, only carbon-based life forms have a chance of evolving in this environment. This is the lower holon determining the possibilities of the higher holons. Now, think about your own brain. Right now, you are having thoughts, and those thoughts are correlated with particular neural activities. Your thought can travel through any number of neural pathways in your brain, but the probabilities around which path that thought will take are being modified by you the thinker, so that some paths become more likely than others. That's an example of the higher setting the probabilities of the lower. Of all the things that could happen at lower levels, certain things become more likely to happen based on the behaviors of the higher holons. Next, the number of levels determines whether it is shallow or deep. The number of holons on any given level determine its span. That one actually comes directly from Arthur Kessler. So if a holon contains a lot of subholons within itself, we say it has a high degree of depth. If there are a great many holons in existence at that level, we say it has a high degree of span. Atoms have very low depth, they're very shallow, but absolutely massive span because they are everywhere and there are a lot of them. Human beings, on the other hand, have much greater depth. Well, some of them anyway. Because they include more holons within them. They include atoms and molecules and cells and organs. But they also have far less span because the total number of atoms in the universe greatly outnumbers the total number of human beings. Which brings us to the next major tenet. Each successive level of evolution produces greater depth and less span. Pretty straightforward. Again, there will always be more atoms than molecules in the universe because each molecule is composed of several atoms. And there will always be more molecules than cells. And more cells than organisms. For the same reason that it takes 7,541 Legos to make a single Millennium Falcon. The greater the depth of the holon, the greater its degree of consciousness. This one relates to Teilhard de Chardin's Law of Complexity and Consciousness. Or as Arthur Kessler put it, quote, On successively higher levels of the hierarchy, we find more complex, flexible, and less predictable patterns of activity. While on successively lower levels, we find more and more mechanized, stereotyped, and predictable patterns. In the language of the physicist, a holon on a higher level of the hierarchy has more degrees of freedom than a holon on a lower level. Next, destroy any type of holon and you will destroy all of the holons above it and none of the holons below it. Which makes sense. If you eliminate all atoms in the universe, you're also eliminating everything that's made from atoms. But if you destroy an organism, its constituent atoms remain unharmed and simply mix back into the environment. This is an important one for reasons that we'll talk about in just a little bit. Next, holarchies co-evolve. In other words, individuals and groups evolve together 
at every step. Next, the micro is in relational exchange with the macro at all levels of its depth. In other words, every holon interacts with other holons at its same level. So your atoms are in relational exchange with other atoms in your environment, as are your molecules and cells, which are exchanging with other molecules and cells at their same holonic levels. This is one of the reasons why you feel so refreshed and recharged when you spend time in nature, because you're allowing your cellular subholons to relate and resonate with similar holons in your environment. Next, evolution has directionality. This is often a controversial idea, particularly since mainstream science tends to insist that evolution is both blind and therefore directionless. Nonetheless, there do seem to be some fundamental directional patterns inherent to evolution. For one, increasing complexity. Things tend to become more complex as they evolve. Also, increasing differentiation and integration. In other words, each stage includes more possible combinations than the last, which means that each stage has more to integrate than the last. There are only 118 ways that subatomic particles can combine to form atoms, but countless more ways that different atoms can combine to form molecules. And it's important to point out that either differentiation or integration can go too far at any of these levels, which will pathologize the holon. Also, increasing organization and structuration. The increasing complexity of the holon requires greater degrees of organization and creates more complex structures as evolution continues to unfold. And then the fourth direction of evolution is towards increasing relative autonomy. Highly evolved holons are more able to regulate their own autonomy than less evolved holons. Ken Wilber uses the example of cold-blooded creatures, warm-blooded creatures, and human beings, and how each is more capable of regulating its environment in order to increase their relative autonomy. Cold-blooded animals stop moving outside of their ideal temperature range, which means they only have autonomy within a specific range of conditions. More evolved creatures have a wider range they can operate within, giving them a wider range of autonomy relative to other holons. And then the final direction of evolution is towards increasing telos. This may seem a little bit esoteric, but hang with me here. It simply means that there's no single pre-given omega point that evolution is working towards, but rather evolution produces a sliding sequence of omega points as each new holon comes into existence. In other words, emergence is itself emergent. Evolution is not deterministic, but neither is it totally blind. Each level is, in a sense, trying to self-organize in such a way that allows the next level to emerge. The eventual emergence of human beings was not inevitable as soon as the first atoms emerged in the universe. What was made inevitable, however, was the emergence of molecules, because atoms have a natural telos guiding their self-organization in order to allow the next holonic level to emerge. So those are the 20 tenets. It's a lot, it's a lot to chew on. But if you'd like to learn more about this, I highly recommend that you pick up Sex Ecology Spirituality by Ken Wilber. Okay, so what isn't a holon? Remember a few minutes ago when I said everything in this universe is either made of or made by holons? Well, that's true, but it doesn't mean that everything is a holon. In fact, there's a lot of things that aren't holons. Rocks aren't holons. Governments aren't holons. Neither are words, weapons, or websites. Cats, on the other hand, are holons. Super cuddly holons who will not hesitate to eat your face after you die. Bad kitty. So, what makes your cat a holon, but not these other things? In a word, interiority. We'll unpack that some more in just a moment. But generally speaking, there's four basic kinds of stuff in the universe. We call them heaps, holes, artifacts, and social holons. A heap is exactly what it sounds like, just a random collection of stuff thrown together. They have no agency, no organizing pattern, and are usually held together by outside forces. 
A cloud, for example, is a heap of water molecules. It is not a holon. The same with rocks, which are heaps of various atoms and molecules, not holons. We can say that, in a sense, atoms and molecules are parts of rocks, but rocks themselves are not holons. They're heaps, not holes random molecules squished together by various gravitational and geological forces. Though I should say that some rocks, crystals for example, are not actually heaps, but social holons. We'll come back to those in just a minute. A hole is exactly what we've been discussing throughout this video. They're holons, but we have to unpack a few things before we can really understand what actually makes something a holon. One of Ken Wilber's major contributions to integral philosophy is known as the four quadrants. We'll get into this in much more detail in a future video, but briefly, all holons possess two critical polarities. They have both interiors and exteriors, and they exist as both individuals and as groups. This gives rise to Ken's famous four quadrant map, which details the four fundamental dimensions that all holons possess. So, all holons have all four quadrants, which means that all holons have some degree of interior experience. Now, this may sound a little bit funny to you at first. You might be saying, wait a minute, all holons have interiors, but you just told me that atoms and molecules are holons. Are you saying to me that atoms and molecules are somehow conscious? Well, personally, I think that they are, at least in a very, very narrow sense. As Alfred North Whitehead said, biology is the study of large organisms, whereas physics is the study of small organisms. The basic idea here is, the more complex the holon, the greater the depth of its interior experience. Your nervous system is far more complex than a penguin's nervous system, which is why your interior consciousness goes so much deeper than a penguin's does. Your dog's brain is much closer to your brain than a worm's brain is, in terms of its complexity, which is why it's so easy to fall in love with your dog, and why you keep forgetting to take your pet worm out for a walk. So I certainly don't think that atoms are conscious like human beings are conscious. They don't feel pleasure or pain, for example. But I personally believe that even subatomic particles possess some tiny sliver of interiority, some minuscule spark of a feeling of being, what Whitehead called prehension, and what others might call panpsychism. So if I ask myself, is it something to be an atom? My answer is sure, but it's not much. The greater the holon's complexity, the greater its consciousness, which to me offers the most simple and elegant and really satisfying solution to the mind-body problem that I can think of. There's no ghost in the machine, because the ghost and the machine are not two different substances. They're not separate from each other. They're two sides of the same coin. In other words, some degree of interiority is intrinsic to all matter and to all life wherever we find it. Every outside has an inside, and this perfect symmetry of exteriors and interiors goes all the way down, even to the first subatomic particles to emerge after the Big Bang. Which means that we don't need to look for some special mechanism that allows consciousness to emerge in the universe, because consciousness is not an accidental byproduct of evolution, but simply the interior dimension of evolution at every level of scale. But it doesn't really matter where you personally want to draw the line. Maybe you think you're Pet worm has some degree of interiority, but this adorable little tardigrade here doesn't. That's totally fine. Some of us thinks it makes sense to push it as far as it goes, turtle interiors all the way down. Either way, by the time we get to things like reptiles, birds, and mammals, I'm betting there's a good chance you recognize some degree of interiority behind their eyes looking back at you. So this is one of the defining characteristics of a holon. It has an interior of some kind, some kind of inner agency. It is something to be a holon. A more technical way to say it is that all holons have a dominant monad, which might sound a little bit kinky, like a holon going to a BDSM party, which 
fair enough, we all like to find fun new ways to put parts into holes. But dominant monad really just means that all holons have an inner agency that governs all of its junior holons. That's why when you decide to take your dog for a walk, 100% of your atoms, molecules, cells, and organs decide to go with you, which is useful whenever you want to go from point A to point B without smearing yourself across the carpet and leaving a nasty stain. So that's a holon. An artifact, meanwhile, is pretty much anything created by a holon or a social holon. A piece of art, a bird's nest, a dining room table. These things have an organizing pattern, but that pattern does not come from its own inner agency like an actual holons does. It's imprinted upon the artifacts by their creator holons. And artifacts can often be arranged holarchically. This very sentence, for example, which is composed of whole letters, which are parts of whole words, which are parts of the whole sentence. But letters, words, and sentences are not holons. They're artifacts, a series of signifiers that are situated in a holarchical syntax in order to communicate different kinds of meaning. They are the expressions of a holon, but not holons themselves. And now we get to social holons, which are basically groups or systems of similar holons working together in some way. Remember the four quadrant graphic I mentioned earlier? We focused on one of the critical polarities, interior and exterior. So let's talk briefly about the other polarity, individual and collective. All holons exist in groups of other similar holons. And just like individual holons, those groups or social holons have their own interior and exterior dimensions. The interior of the group can be thought of as its culture, and the exterior of the group is something like its systems or environment or collective actions. And just as a holon's exterior complexity determines the interior depth of its consciousness, so does the average complexity and depth of each holon in a group determine the complexity of its systems and the depth of its culture. For example, let's look at four different kinds of social holons. A crystal, an ant colony, a flock of birds, and a human society. As I mentioned earlier, a crystal is a perfect example of a social holon. It is not itself a whole, but rather a collective of similar atoms that are systemically locked into a perfect repeating pattern. It's really about as harmonious and uneventful as a social holon can possibly get. What is it to be a single atom in a crystal? What would its culture feel like? I suppose it'd be comforting in a way, always knowing exactly where you belong. Maybe a bit creatively stifling. There's just not a whole lot to do. But what about an ant colony? They certainly show a far greater range of creativity and complexity than a crystal does. Sure, a simple crystal includes more atoms than we can possibly imagine, 10 to the power of brain aneurysm. But those atoms are very boring. They don't do much. Their parties suck and their culture is about as shallow as it gets. The average ant colony, on the other hand, only consists of a few hundred thousand ants, but each of those ants are composed of their own atoms, their own molecules, and their own cells. They have far greater depth than atoms, but considerably less span. And the levels of complexity that we see in ant colonies are staggering. The sum of its behavior seems so much greater than the capacity of any individual ant in the colony. It almost feels like its own individual holon. Ken Wilber calls this sort of distributed intelligence a form of nexus agency, which is sort of a pseudo agency that emerges in the collective and organizes the behavioral patterns of its individual members. What is it to be a single ant in an ant colony? What would its culture feel like, living entirely in a universe of pheromones and total loyalty to the queen? And then we have flocks of birds, 
such as this Mermation of Starlings, which can I just say is such an awesome name, a Mermation of Starlings. It's really kind of cool that we have so many colorful words for all these different bird related social holons. But anyway, just look at these little dinosaurs. Look at the hypnotic complexity that they're displaying. All of these birds flowing together so seamlessly. Look at the organizational patterns rippling through the mermation as it morphs into these different shapes and patterns in perfect harmony with the invisible currents beneath each of their little wings. It's almost like they're making art together, communicating something in a language that we cannot possibly perceive. What is it to be one of these birds? What does its culture feel like? So perfectly in sync with each other, yet so playful and free. And of course, human beings create social holons everywhere we go. And these social holons are often arranged in a holarchical way. Families are parts of neighborhoods, which are parts of cities, which are parts of states and then nations and then the rest of the globe. But none of these are holons themselves. They are a spectrum of social holons that emerged holarchically over history. This is why when it comes to social holons, we try to be careful with our words. We are not parts of social holons. We are members of social holons. Why is this so important, this distinction between being a member of a social holon and being a part of a social holon? Well, as Arthur Kessler pointed out way back in 1967, human beings are fundamentally engaged in two contradictory drives, the need to be a whole individual and the need to be a part of a greater, higher whole. And just as Kessler observed, our drive to be part of something greater than ourselves can easily mislead us into becoming members of something that is far less evolved and far more dangerous. We confuse two different kinds of drives, the drive to be a holonic part of a greater whole versus the drive to be in community with other wholes who are similar to us. This brings us back to something we talked about earlier, the difference between growth hierarchies and dominator hierarchies. One of the common features of totalitarian regimes everywhere is that they co-opt the language of growth hierarchies and twist it into justification for dominator hierarchies, convincing people that either they themselves or their ideology is the higher greater whole that we should all want to be a part of. So let's maybe try to keep an eye out for that since we seem to be seeing a bit of a resurgence of this kind of thinking around the world these days. The other reason this distinction is so important is because it helps us better understand the overall shape of the universe and our place in that universe. We think that we are part of our town, which is part of our nation, which is part of our ecosystem, which is part of our solar system, which is part of our galaxy. But we have that all wrong. It's a problem of scale mostly. We tend to think that little things are parts of bigger things. But in reality, we are not part of the galaxy. The galaxy is part of us. Galaxies and the billions of stars that compose them are simply the social holons created by atoms, giant communities of atoms which consist of subatomic particles as their junior holons. Planets are communities of molecules with atoms and particles as its subholons. Ecosystems are communities of cells with molecules, atoms, and particles as its subholons, and so forth, all the way up to human civilization itself. As a general rule, individual holons tend to get bigger as they develop from one level to the next, while social holons tend to get smaller. But we're not part of the galaxy. The galaxy, or rather the atoms that it is composed of, is part of us. And now more than ever, we need to remember that things like planets and ecosystems are actually part of us and not vice versa. Why? Because this is how holons work. As we talked about earlier, if you destroy a lower holon, you also destroy everything above it. If we eliminate all human beings on the planet, the ecosystem would go on without us, all the better for our absence. Because we are not parts of the ecosystem, the ecosystem is part of us. But if we eliminate the ecosystem, well, let's hope we don't find out what happens because there will be nobody left to tell our story 
and this dark corner of the Milky Way. So all of this, I think, naturally leads to the question of what is the higher whole that we should all be aspiring to in our lives? And there's many different ways to answer this question and many different kinds of wholeness that we can seek in order to fulfill this natural holonic drive towards wholeness and towards being a part of a greater whole. And we'll go into many of these in much greater detail in future episodes. But the first answer is to recognize all the little parts of us that are not yet integrated into the whole, the various shadows and traumas and addictions and allergies that are hiding in our unconscious. We call this the path of cleaning up, where we learn to confront these little broken off parts of ourselves and work with them directly until we reintegrate them back into the whole. There are numerous different shadow practices that you can find, many of which are available on integrallife.com, so be sure to check them out. The second answer is to recognize that we have an entire sequence of whole parts within ourselves and to do whatever it takes to grow to new levels of wholeness in our own lives. We sometimes like to call this the path of growing up, where we engage in any number of practices to grow to the next stage of our own development whatever that may be. Think of it this way. Can you remember the way you saw the world when you were, let's say, 16 years old? Can you remember just the overall feel of your mind, the shape of your interiors, what it felt like to be you? Can you see all of the ways that your thinking was more partial than it is today? Not in a bad way, just a little bit more limited by your lack of experience, a bit less adapted to the complexities of life you couldn't see then, but you can clearly see today. Now, can you also see how the person you were then, the sense of wholeness and who-ness that you felt as a teenager, is still a fundamental part of the whole person you are today? how the shape of your mind today is in many ways built upon the shapes of mind you had in the past. Transcending and including and reorganizing all of your past experiences. Now, think about the person you will be 10 to 20 years from now. How the wholeness that you feel today, that you feel right now, will become a part of the wholeness that you will feel tomorrow. You are part of that whole. So feel that and put yourself in service to your future wholeness. As human beings continue to grow, we pass through several broad holarchical stages of development. First, an egocentric stage where we're primarily driven by our own needs and desires. And then to an ethnocentric stage where we begin to identify with groups of people that share a common culture or ethnicity or a code as we do. And then to a world-centric stage where we begin to include all sorts of different people, cultures, and ideas into our overall sense of self. And after the world-centric stage, we begin to grow into the next stage known as the cosmocentric stage, where our minds become reoriented and reintegrated and a new kind of awareness begins to open up within us. A sense of being aware of awareness itself, a persisting and pervasive meta-awareness that becomes the new seat of our identity. A new sense of wholeness that includes all parts, all holes, all heaps and artifacts and social holons that come into our awareness. This cosmocentric stage is the highest kind of developmental wholeness that we currently know about. But the meta-awareness that I just described, that awareness of awareness itself, that is actually available to us at every point in our development, from childhood until our elder years. It's one of several states of consciousness that we can access at any time if we simply learn how. Which brings us to the path of waking up which delivers us to a radically different kind of wholeness, a total union of self and not self, where we become one with all levels of reality all at once, which is just about as whole as it gets when you think about it, or when you stop thinking about it, when you become aware of yourself thinking or not thinking about it. Something like that. <laughs> <laughs> 
There are all sorts of practices and prayers and meditations to help people access and experience this radical sense of wholeness. The most simple being, simply sit, breathe, and gently watch your mind. And then try to notice the quiet, ever-present awareness that's always been sitting behind your eyes, behind every sensation, behind every experience you've ever had. Practice becoming that which you've always already been. And then here's the final way that you can become part of something greater than yourself. You can like, share, and subscribe to this channel. Even better, you can become a member of Integral Life, which is a membership-supported social hold-on that's helping to support the emergence of a new kind of wholeness in the world, a more integral wholeness that can help put the broken parts of the world and ourselves back together again. Remember earlier when I cautioned you not to confuse your drive to be part of something more whole than yourself with the desire to become a member of social hold-ons that can actually take us further away from our wholeness. Well, this is still true, and something we definitely need to keep a careful eye on. But it's also true that human beings are wired to seek community. There are any number of organizations out there that can help support and deepen your growth to wholeness by plugging you into a community of people who are doing the same in their own lives. If that sounds like the kind of project that you would like to support, then I invite you to become a member of Integral Life today. So that's it. Whole ons in a nutshell, or sort of a nutshell inside of a nutshell, inside of another even larger nutshell, something like that. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this video. My name is Corey DeVos. You can find me at IntegralLife.com. And please stay tuned for future Integral Explainer videos to come.